mood and support from theory to application. We know that sport produces strong emotions. We know from our own experience the anxiety before competition, the emotions that are experienced from whether we are successful and unsuccessful. Emotions experienced as competitors, emotions experienced as fans. Uh, sport produces strong emotions and few people would dispute that fact. We know that sport produces a range of emotions. We've got four examples here. We've got the feeling of energised and determined. Frustration. And sport produces a mass of frustration because our goals to perform as well as we can or to a win a particular contest are being denied by the opposing team or the opposition. We might feel subdued as a consequence of being frustrated. We can't get our act together, we can't play as well as we'd like, we were brilliant in training on one day and not so good in competition the next day. And it might be despair that the sport can be a very lonely place where where performance is publicly viewed and it's not going as planned and you're playing well below you, what, you what you're capable of. But sport produces a range of emotions. Think of your own sporting experiences and think of the range of emotions you have experienced and they are considerable. It's always worth questioning whether emotions can help performance or be harmful for performance. Do you get yourself into a certain psychological state that means that you're ready for ready to play and that is the best um, you're going to be the play as best you possibly can, or can sometimes emotions be destructive? We've got a classic example here where we've got clearly emotions being destructive in a sport where it might seem that getting angry and an intense emotional state, which might be quite seen as quite helpful for performance it can be destructive or productive um, and it can the switch from being helpful to harmful can occur, can occur immediately so our starting point in our discussion is that we agree that performance influence emotions we suggest that emotions in turn influence performance more importantly the control of emotions is very important and related to that is the pre-competition mindset is extremely important because the mindset we get in at the start of competition can affect the type of emotions we experience during the competition. Related to this, of course, is the idea, this, the process, the understanding of the process through which the emotional state experience at the start of the game then in, interacts with situational factors personal goals to um, change during the game and that process is very important. We, we propose that possibly emotional control produces success and that is not only in sport but in other, in other domains where goal achievement is seen as a personal, um, a personal aim. What next? Well this lecture is linked with a series of hyperlinks where you click on the um, various um, heading and you'll be taken to um, the part of the lecture where you want to start and one area is where you could start is is the notion of validity and validity being the bedrock of science and in that um, part of this lecture you'll look at the validation of measures of mood used in sport. In another aspect of this lecture we look at the iceberg where the iceberg has melted and the, the search for the iceberg profile um, which is the mood profile characterized success led to a huge number of being studies being collected in um, the 70s, 80s and 90s. We look at mood states in applied and real world settings where researchers and research based practitioners have collected data to um, help in their work. So you think what you want to do next? We have, and this is a large part of my work, a theory of mood and performance relationship which puts depression as a key mood state within this model. And then finally we have mood and emotional intelligence. And emotional intelligence largely be con being concerned with our ability to regulate our moods being possibly the future research direction and applied um, usage of mood in, um, in research and applied settings.
Mood profiling starts with the individual completing a mood questionnaire and the summarised scores are then added up and they uh, relate to dimensions of the mood construct. We then plot those mood states and we then now look at what um, is a typical example of a mood questionnaire used in sport. And this is based on the profile of mood states and it's a shortened version by um, Terry, Kehoe and Lane. And we have um, six items there, there are 24 items in this questionnaire, but the response format is the same for various different types of mood measures. We have a single item, panicky, sad, lively, confused, furious and worn out down um, one hand side, and then the individuals asked to rate how they're feeling, right how they're feeling at that very moment on a five point scale going from not at all to four being extremely and people have to think back to think to how they're feeling and then rate how they're feeling accordingly. It's, it's a relatively straightforward process but it does require individuals to have insight into how they're feeling at that time and then some people are are not feeling sad and therefore writing not at all but the, but presenting them with the item may they may may ask them to introspect a little bit on how they're feeling and it it may well make people conscious of their feelings so th this is the process and it's typically done there are issues with this process about raising people's awareness of how they're feeling at that moment but it's relatively straightforward to do and the profile of mood states which a great deal of research has been conducted um, on has six scales tension um, depression anger vigor fatigue and confusion and the um, there's a logic to this order in terms of how these are then plotted on a graph because the graph then displays what's called an iceberg profile and Morgan and his colleagues did a huge amount of research on the iceberg in sport trying to find out what the what mood profiles were associated with success and they came up with this notion that an iceberg where the score of 50 on the side is the average mood state for, for an individual and that athletes will score higher on vigour with 55 being their score and lower on tension, depression, anger, fatigue and confusion in other words they're lower on the unpleasant mood states and higher on the pleasant mood states and I've deliberately chosen the words pleasant and unpleasant because um, rather than um, positive and negative mood states because anger and tension are certainly unpleasant mood states but their impact on motivated behaviour may well be helpful and therefore they may be positive in terms of goal attainment even if they, uh, even if they um, feel unpleasant. Now what happened as I alluded to there have been lots of research and we've had several reviews of uh, mood and performance research and what we had in the 1990s coming to a head in 1995 were two reviews that came out exactly the same time one by Rowley and um, colleagues in 1995 and the other by Peter Terry in 1995 and what Rowley did was a meta-analysis which summarizes the data from a number of studies together and found that mood states predicted very little of the variance in performance and what they then came up with the suggestion is that researchers really should abandon the POMS and lots of people had used it but it wasn't adding much in terms of variance explained and therefore you collect data on the POMS but raises the question well, so what in, in simple terms because it wasn't about to predict behaviour Terry took a far more selective view of um, using, the prom, using the POMS and argued that it's quite a useful tool because it can predict performance under certain conditions and, and Terry looked at the nature of mood from a very much a logical perspective and came up with a few recommendations about how practitioner based researchers should use the profile of mood states if it's to provide helpful data in their work. But it's interesting that as you get two very contrasting views on the effectiveness of POMS when two research groups um, are looking at the same data but choosing to interpret that data very differently to uh, simply provide an example where um, there is not there's more than one answer to explain the results that are being uh, presented. 
So the position would be to any researcher in 1995, it could be that um, we should abandon the POMs, in, as what Rowley was saying, and there's good reason for that in some um, respects, in that clearly when we look at the, the mood states assessed by the POMs, there's a sort of lack of positive mood states, certainly, there's, and there's a lack of of um, pleasant mood states, and we have, it could well be that mood states which are positive and pleasant, such as happiness, may be very useful for performance, and researchers may well say, so actually, we've got this measure of, of called the profile of mood states, and we really think we should um, um, start again. So, we could say we'll stop using the profile of mood states. Taking Terry's argument that mood is as assessed by the POMs is quite useful and therefore starting again could be described through the phrase throwing the baby out with the bathwater. In other words, there's lots of useful stuff that the POMs does and we're choosing to throw the whole thing away and start again which may miss some of the good things. And importantly from a researcher and practitioner's base perspective is that it's possible that you reproduce the bad things. So, POMS research, baby in the bathwater. The first point to note is that POMS research has been plagued, and plagued being the appropriate term in, in that there are so many methodological and theoretical limitations, and we'll look at some of those as we go through, but there, the notion that two studies have both used the POMS and therefore addressing the same question is... Um, so difficult to deter so difficult to argue because of the different ways in which the researchers have, have used the measure and used and assessed performance. Firstly, there's no definition of mood, and therefore we're uncertain whether the researchers think mood states is something of a of a stable characteristic. The idea that of, of Morgan's suggestion that elite athletes experience positive mood more often than non-elite athletes would hint at the notion that mood states are somewhat stable. Well, certainly other definitions of mood would say it's far more transient. With, and related to that is that researchers have not res not reported the time frame, hence it's unclear what has been measured. Now, if we asked you to, ha to assess how you're feeling right now, do you feel angry, do you feel depressed right now, you um, would provide a score accordingly and, and it would more likely be not that angry or not that depressed. If we asked you to think back carefully over the past week and record your score, you would scan your memory for situations where you felt a range of different emotions. If those situations were important um, and the emotions were very intense, you would provide a score accordingly. You might be in a very good mood at the moment and situations completely unrelated to the situation would be then be would then be rated in from would be rated in your profile of mood state score. So if we took a, a measure of mood before performance and we found that someone was quite angry because they had an an, an argument with their coach or their parents earlier on the week um, um, or they got um, an argument with their partner but um, uh, and then went to play sport performance, it might well be that the anger is completely dissipated in terms of how they're feeling at the moment and they're not even fo not focused at all on the cause of the anger earlier in the week. In other words, having a score of angry may be irrelevant to how they're feeling at the moment and it's how they're feeling at the moment which is likely to impact on how they'll perform. A further limitation is that the POMs are never validated for use in sport. This is clearly a challenge that all researchers should undertake, is that if they're using measures developed in one population, it is um, important to validate that on the new population. And one of the major limitations is a research design that compares level of achievement with the quality of performance, in that we compare the mood states of elite v non-elite athletes v the mood states of two people performing in the same competition. Well, there's no real reason why two athletes, why an elite athlete would have a different mood state than a non-elite athlete when we assess mood away from competition. A non-elite athlete could be in a very good mood if they've, um, if on the morning they complete the questionnaire they've just received a tax rebate and the elite athlete may be in a very bad mood if the morning they complete the questionnaire they have just um, receive noti uh, notice that they um, um, have to pay council tax. So 
whilst that does well and so um, it's important to distinguish what the research question achieved to address that the studies that look at level of achievement treat mood as stable and therefore theoretically are questionable whether that's a valid use of mood against studies that look to assess whether two athletes on the start line whether the athlete in the, the um, um, best mood state is likely to perform better than the athlete in a less optimal mood state. So we'll highlight some of the work of Peter Terry because it was conducted as a practitioner in applied settings and what he did is collected data as part of his work with athletes and we've got athletes here from um, um, rowing, world championship rowing and Olympic rowing and what we find is that um, he, he can collect correctly classify uh, whether athletes perform to their own expectations which is the blue um, line, PE performance to expectations or underperforms which is the red line underperformed and what we have there is that um, both before athletes who performed to their expectation and underperforming athletes reported what could be described as an iceberg profile on the profile of mood states but performing to expectations before produce a more pronounced iceberg however what we have there is a, a clear example of where mood profiling was quite useful in performance prediction and useful in applied settings same um, method athletes complete the mood measure the night before competition and this is relevant to the practitioner because it allows him to be able to intervene if possible although no interventions were conducted in this period where data were being collected and this, these are with um, elite rowers and we have a hundred percent prediction karate again very high prediction at 92 percent and what we'll notice from here is that um, winners were associated with higher anger and that might be not be too surprising in a sport of karate in which um, feeling angry could be interpreted as um, ready to compete rather than um, um, rather than true anger in terms of uh, a loss of um, a loss of control so Rowley did one one uh, meta-analysis what Chris Beedy did was a second meta-analysis which took into account the type of research design and what they found in studies which which sought to predict a single performance that vigor tended to be good for performance confusion fatigue and depression poor for performance anger and tension and not surprisingly being high arousal being unpleasant but mood states that could be associated with motivated behavior in some instances but demotivated in other instances were associated with it, with just that in the in a, across the studies and fatigue had very weak relationships Following the reviews in 1995, two issues needed to be addressed in the mood literature. And there were theoretical issues regarding the definition of mood and the effect of mood states on performance and motivation. And second was the measurement issues related um, to the study of mood because the mood measure was developed principally for use in clinical settings. They need addressing together. But we started with looking at the validation of the POMS model of mood in that what McNair developed was this model with um, anger, tension, confusion, depression, fatigue and vigour. And then Peter Terry started a line of research in the early 90s which validated a 24 item measure on the same factors, firstly among school children, then amongst adult uh, um, adolescents. Um, athletes leading to validating on athletes and um, sports students 
and the the Brunel Mood Scale, which which um, was a name for the uh, 24 item version of the Poms, was really subjected to a a um, robust validation program. It demonstrated face validity by asking school children what what do they mean by the the items that were presented to them? What does um, sad mean? What does depressed mean? What does anxious mean? And then um, school children rated whether they understood the meaning of items and whether they thought those items related to the mood state um, factors they were proposed to assess. And that that was a really comprehensive stage, and it allowed the individuals who will later complete the test to have a say in what the um, test will be assessing. Let's follow that by factorial validity. Factorial validity is where you get a large amount of participants to complete the questionnaire and then you test the extent to which the item proposed to assess anger will load into a scale, an anger scale, and the same for all the other factors. So factorial validity is one of the most robust ways of developing a, um, the validity of a, of a scale one, it uses large samples of people, and two, it can use um, a strict um, statistical criteria for ensuring that the scales are valid. Predictive and concurrent validity, what that's all about is, do scores on the questionnaire predict behaviour in line how they should do? And concurrent validity is concerned with, do scores on the questionnaire relate with um, a similar scale proposed to assess the same thing? and, and the supported um, both predictive and concurrent validity and getting on to that there are norms available for school children for ad adolescent athletes before competition and the same for adults in a lecture and adults before competition So arguably the BRUMS provides a valid measure for assessing the mood states assessed in the profile of mood states before competition. Um, because it has been validated so that it items are easily understood, it takes most athletes less than two minutes to complete. and We, we have good evidence for that because we've used it in over 2,000 um, administrations. It's possibly one of the most comprehensive uh, measures w um, that's been validated in all of sport research. And more recently, we've translated it to Arabic, Hungarian, and Italian athletes, so it, its validity holds up across different cultures. So, with a measure of the six con concepts um, developed, the next one was to look at the nature of mood. And the research up until um, this definition presented by Peter Terry and myself, um, we'd, you'd look for a definition of mood in the commonly used um, sport and exercise psychology textbooks and you wouldn't have found one. So we sought to provide a definition which is not as easy a task as what it should be. So we said it's a set of feelings. Mood is defined as a set of feelings. The set of feelings because mood states is not about one mood, it's not about anger, it's not about happiness, it's about a c combination of mood states. It's a combination of mood states that's important. So a set of feelings was carefully considered to but that's part of the definition. Ephemeral in nature, and that's also important in that mood states are transitory. They change from moment to moment, they change over time, they're affected by situational and personal factors, but they change. Ephemeral. Varying in intensity and duration. And that was this is also important in that one of the one of the distinctions proposed between mood and emotions is that emotions are shorter in intensity and um, shorter sh uh, shorter in duration and higher in intensity. Um, well, that is true to some degree, but you can have um, relatively long-lasting um, emotions and relatively long-lasting moods. And then finally. We wanted to just emphasise that uh, mood states is more than one emotion. A key part of the nature of mood is the argument that individuals act on the information provided by mood states. So when you're feeling angry, those feelings of anger affect your thinking and affect the choices you make, how, what you behave, what you're going to do, 
and and so on and it's the it's the argument that the effective content of mood has an effect on thinking and an effect on behavior which is important so if you understand what the mood states is all about what its nature it's it, you can then work out how that should affect behavior now we developed a conceptual model of mood and performance and what that model is um, uh, is most controversial aspect was dividing depression into two groups a depressed group and non depressed group and arguing that when an athlete feels a combination of mood states of which um, depression is experienced they will tend to interpret anger and tension as being debilitative of performance the argument that when individuals feel angry and depressed together then the negative self image and self talk and self thoughts that comes with feeling depressed and feeling unworthy when they feel the arousal that comes from feeling uncertain about achieving goal important goal related outcomes then that's going to lead to um, demotivated behavior where the person may seek to disengage with the task by contrast when in, an individual feels anger but um, has no symptoms of depression and this is slightly confusing uh, but it's based on the, the um, usage of the um, brums to profile athletes before competition but really are feeling angry tense and excited and when they're feeling angry tense and excited it's suggesting that their meta beliefs in, of anger and tension will be used to motivate um, behavior in other words I'm angry but I'm frustrated that and, and frustrated because unless I perform really well I won't achieve my um, goals and therefore the individual um, increases their effort to and concentrates on the key performance um, key performance cues in order to bring about successful performance so we sought to test the hy hypothesized model and the first was that when an athlete feels depressed they'll feel a general un negative and unpleasant mood profile and the results just support this very clearly in that when people report some symptoms of depression they report much higher anger, confusion, fatigue and tension and much lower vigor and that's almost, that finding has almost been um, repeated in every study we've done to test the hypothesized model. The notion that vigor is associated with good performance, confusion and fatigue, poor performance has been partially con has been partially supported. Uh, the most interesting hypothesis was the switching effect for anger and tension. That, uh, that anger and tension will be associated with good performance when in an absence of depression. And we've said curvilinear on the argument that very very high anger and tension is likely also to be associated with debilitating performance. And there's general support for that to some degree in that there is a weak relationship between anger and performance and good performance. Anger and people will um, tend to um, say not underperform when they're feeling angry and tense but not depressed. Um, what we did um, for the conference presentation in Australia in 2005, we did a meta-analysis on the um, studies that tested the Nain and Terry hypotheses and what we found was that the effect size for anger was reasonably high, effect size of confusion was high, effect size of fatigue, tension and vigor were high and uh, they know the differences between mood states. When we looked at the switching effect for mood performance relationships we can see very clearly that the switching effect for anger is that no depression is associated with good performance whereas with depression associated with poor performance. Similar trend for tension but not as strong for the um, debilitating effect of tension when experienced with um, experienced with depressed mood. Vigor is associated pretty much strongly with good performance and confusion weakly with poor performance. Fatigue has relatively weak relationships with performance in both groups but non-existent in the no depression group. So we argued that the conceptual model 
developed in 2005, which we review in an article with Chris Beattie and Matt Stevens, made an important contribution to the literature in two ways. One, it represented a plausible explanation for contradictory findings in the previous mood performance research, particularly in relation to anger and tension. And secondly, it provided testable hypotheses and stopped research from handing out the POMs in a sort of random way and hoping to find that elite athletes are associated with um, uh, elite athletes reported a good mood. The theoretical developments from the model, well clearly one of the limitations is the absence of positive emotions and the notion that positive emotions are captured exclusively through vigour is somewhat limiting in terms of the range of positive emotions that exist. So we've added happiness and calmness um, to the mood profiling um, approach. And secondly, we look to explore relationships between emotional intelligence, with the emotional intelligence really describing an athlete's ability to appraise the emotions that emotional states that they're in to be able to regulate those emotional states, what they can do to change those emotions, um, to use emotions to help behaviour, and to um, and and that's not just in themselves, but in in their relationships with other people also. So, emotional intelligence and mood states should logically be related. So the revised conceptual model has brought happiness to to provide some variance to the depression no depression di um, dichotomy in that it's trying to find more information out about the um, the nature of when someone reports no symptoms of of depression return to emotional intelligence as the area for future research emotional intelligence <coughs> has been defined in many different ways in the literature and finding a, a consensus of um, in terms of a definition is going to be very difficult. The definition we've been using is the ability to monitor one's own emotions, to discriminate them and use this information to guide one's thinking and actions. In other words, it's about your perception of your own emotions and, your, and how you can use those to Im um, in a positive way and research indicates that emotional intelligence is associated with successful performance in a range of different performance domains academic business and sport and and that is a really a growing literature supporting the utility of emotional intelligence in terms of its links with um, desirable outcomes uh, Emotional intelligence is as an adaptive construct, and where we've got um, emotional intelligence is leading into the into the adaptive process. So on one hand, we have the um, the event, the competitive demand, the academic de um, demands, which is going to be important to the study we're going to be describing shortly, and then the outcomes of that are athletic success and academic success. And what we're looking at is the extent to which emotional intelligence is associated with optimal and dysfunctional mood states associated with performance. Participants completed the BRUMS and a measure of emotional intelligence and what we did is we did this retrospectively and I asked participants to think very carefully about a situation in sport and academia when they were successful and unsuccessful and then report how they felt before those two situations. So it's retrospective, it's your memory of mood states rather than the actual mood states experience in real time. But what that does do, it provides a, uh, an insight into meta-beliefs, if you like, of emotional experiences. Do, uh, do athletes believe that anger can be helpful performance? And are those memories of anger being linked to successful performance, are they logged in, in the memory in some way? What we can see from this graph are the mood states associated with best and worst performance by condition with best performance for sport in blue, best examination in purple, worst sport in a sort of a yellowy, lighty, creamy colour and worst examination in light blue. And we can see clear differences in best and worst performance and these differences 
um, are quite logical in terms of the pleasant unpleasant dimensions of mood states. In the unpleasant mood states, anger, confusion, depression, fatigue and tension tend to be associated with poor performance in both sport and um, examination conditions and whereas the, the uh, pleasant mood states of ha happiness, calmness and vigour tend to be associated with best performance in both conditions. But we can also see that there are differences um, for best performance between um, quantitative anger where higher anger is associated with better sport performance than is for best examination performance as an example. So what we've got here is the general trend that mood states related performance is supported but also the notion that m the optimal mood states associated with sport performance differ to the optimal mood states associated with academic performance. What we have here is the anger by performance by situation by emotional intelligence and what we have is that individuals high in emotional intelligence differ in their ability to use anger to bring about best performance than individuals low in emotional intelligence and what this is saying and it's quite important to um, to recognize this is that emotionally intelligent athletes have beliefs that high anger and this really is quite low anger in terms of a real high low but higher anger can be very helpful for performance and that's probably because previously there have been situations where feeling angry has been used in a motivational way and they therefore can recognize that when they feel angry again they can control anger and produce best performance So some of the future directions of emotional intelligence research in terms of what we've been doing here at the University of Wolverhampton. We revisited the emotional intelligence scale and we have evidence to say that this is going to be valid for use in sports. We're looking at the stability of emotional intelligence, particularly with reference to developing interventions to change emotional intelligence, which should, should be key to its utility in, in the area. We conducted research which looked at the relationship with psychological skills and very nicely that those athletes who use psychological skills tend to report higher emotional intelligence but what we don't know is if we put athletes on an intervention to increase their usage of psychological skills whether that would lead to an in enhanced emotional intelligence or by contrast, we did it the other way around, is whether if we put them on a intervention to raise their emotional intelligence that would lead to an increased usage of psychological skills. In other words, athletes would start engaging in self-talk and start engaging in imagery simply as a consequence of being able to um, of being able to um, appraise their own emotions more effectively. I've also looked at emotional intelligence and mental toughness, and the idea that athletes with a resilient self-belief also possess beliefs that they can control their emotions, and those concepts seem quite closely related. We'll look now at some of the applied research that has been conducted in, in mood states and performance mainly. Um, one study funded by the um, British Olympic Association looked at mood state changes in the GB biathlon team preparing for the um, Winter Olympics. What we have here is the mood state scores at each altitude training camp. And the intervention worked by having athletes train at sea level and then going to two altitude training camps in teens at, um, to see the effect of whether the training in the altitude chamber at sea level would be associated with not experiencing unpleasant moods at, um, at altitude and there's quite a lot of evidence to show that going to altitude does lead to mood states associated with overtraining because of the um, lack of oxygen means that athletes get fatigued far earlier and what we have in the first camp 
was a, a big difference in fatigue which we look at in the um, in the next slide and this slide we see that the first day of the training camp the fatigue scores are very similar we'd expect that there's always a little bit of excitement as you go to a camp particularly in um, teens in the summer where the you know, beautiful sunshine and everyone's together and it's quite a jolly atmosphere they then go training and the following a relatively light training session where they expect to feel reasonably good at the first camp they felt really quite fatigued and as you can see that over time the fatigue maintained at quite a high level at the first camp whereas in the second camp they've either modified their training accordingly or physiologically they're able to adapt far better but we haven't got the increase in fatigue which is going to make them feel far more positive about then build, building harder training later in the week so the the rise in fatigue in day three is more is due to a harder training session be due to the, um, data being fed to the coach and the other support team that they have um, acclimatized reasonably effectively so the conclusions that came from the biathlon study was one to get accurate assessments of mood um, responses to training at baseline conditions Second, to identify individual mood profile, and this was quite useful because what we found was that uh, athletes um, could either cope very effectively and had reported very little differences, although the mean score would tend to show that most of them reported in a similar way. There were some people who reported very debilitating mood profiles to altitude, and others far less so. But so the individual uh, mood profiling is very effective. Regardless of that, it's, it helps to teach athletes adaptive coping skills. So when they do feel these um, uh, difficult emotional states and they start could start interpreting them as unhelpful performance, they can have strategies to, in order to overcome that. Related to that is to encourage them to use self-regulation skills, such as using music, using sociological support. And in this case, which was quite a, an interesting observation, is that much of the work which led to psychological benefits was due to a physiologically driven intervention in that because they believed that they were going to they were going to um, train far better following the physiologically based intervention it could well be that um, they psychologically um, experienced better mood states accordingly in other words it could be a large placebo effect going on here even so it still would lend support to the notion that the intervention was effective Look at a second study of which um, conducted with the English Institute of Sport which looked at mood and sleep profiles during during an expedition to the South Pole um, and we focused predominantly on fatigue and vigour in that not too surprisingly the um, the fatigue scores and vigour scores fatigue all about being feeling energetic and lively fatigue all about feeling not being tired and exhausted will change accordingly on a solo expedition as you would trudge through the snow on a day-by-day basis because there's, there's a 45-day trip here. We start from baseline and what we can see is the reasonably high vigour scores, up and down vigour scores um, throughout most of the um, expedition other than until after around about day 37 when vigour gets really quite low and fatigue gets really quite high. And what was evident from this is the argument that is the argument that individuals can experience extremely unpleasant emotional states, very high fatigue, very low vigor, but interpret these very differently. And that high fatigue was expected in this instance. You have an experienced explorer who learned to cope with the physiological difficulties of such a task, and rather than being affected by the fatigue in a demotivational way. Experiencing this fatigue was an indication of goal achievement and while and therefore learn to interpret it in a positive way and learn to dissociate with the fatigue and try to de deregulate uh, feelings of anger and depression that might accompany fatigue in some individuals. So this lecture, and it's quite a long lecture, I appreciate that, has said that mood states relate with behaviour and certainly relates to psychological states that relate with behaviour and, and certainly relate with um, thoughts and feelings about how hard to try, what to think about. 
but particularly indicate that depressed mood is, is debilitating of performance. It argues that monitoring psychological states in the training phases can provide useful information on which to develop interventions. Emotional intelligence and what comes with emotional intelligence, the use of self-regulatory skills and adaptive coping skills could be key to developing effective interventions for emotional control.